right, good morning, everyone. Y'all are awake. That is awesome, awesome, awesome. So to wake you up a little bit more, um, just really quickly, I'm, we are taking a break, uh, as you can see, from the, uh, from the Revelation series. I don't know about you, but I have thoroughly enjoyed that, um, and I have also thoroughly had my toes stepped on uh, with uh, that sermon series. So this morning, uh, you can see the passage that we are going to begin with, uh, John 3, 1 through 17. Um, and there is a lot, a whole lot in that passage. And there's also a whole lot that we're going to cover. So um, if you don't mind, turn to the person next to you and say, buckle up, buttercup. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. You can follow directions, turn to the person next to you and say, buckle up, buttercup. Buckle up, buttercup. Very good, very good, very good. So let's pray again, and then we will uh, we'll jump in. God, we come to you this morning, and again, we thank you for just the opportunity to be here. Lord, I ask that as uh, I talk, God, as I ramble, um, that you would make sense of it all, um, and that it would be your words and not mine. It's in your son's name we ask all these things. Amen. All right, so as I said, uh, this morning we are going to dive into a passage of Scripture um, that I like to say um, lays it all out there, really lays it all out there. Um, just to give you a little hint, uh, there is a very there's a, there's a particular verse that is going to be familiar um, to all of you, I hope, and if not, you will be familiar with it, and it begins something like this, for God so loved, and you could all finish that, I know you can, and we'll get there, we'll get there, for God so loved. Part of what is exciting to me, or for me, I think for us this morning, is that we get to take a look at and learn about what was going on around that verse. Um, we get to learn um, what that statement is, and then we get to learn about what was going on when that statement was made and, and who it was said to. That one statement, that in one verse, we have the gospel in its most simple of forms. So let's take a look at what was going on um, and who was involved as Jesus made this um, foundational saving, hope-filled statement. Um, and further, what does God wish to say to us this morning through that word? So if you would, turn in your Bibles or turn your attention to the screens um, to John chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 17. I'll ask you to stand as we read God's word, if you are able. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that, that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we, what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. This passage um, focuses around a man named Nicodemus. And if we're going to understand the full magnitude of, of what this passage is telling us, then it's really important that, that we understand a little bit more about Nicodemus. 
First, we know that Nicodemus was a, uh, he was a Pharisee. The title uh, Pharisee is, is pretty infamous throughout the New Testament. Um, it doesn't give you warm, fuzzy feelings when you hear the term Pharisee. It's always the Pharisees that are giving Jesus problems, right? Always arguing. And as a result, it seems that Jesus is constantly butting heads with them. But who, who were they? Who were they? Literally, if you look up the, the definition of a Pharisee, it says this, a Pharisee is a member of an ancient Jewish sect distinguished by strict, strict observance of the traditional and written law and commonly held to have uh, pretensions to superior sanctity. They were the folks that, I guess you would say, walked around town with their heads held high just knowing, just knowing that they were better than you, right? They had it all together. They had all the answers. They knew everything, and they were proud of that. They were Jews just like Jesus, but they didn't like Jesus. Not one bit. They didn't just not like him, but refused to accept him as a Messiah, God's son. Uh, they, they had a, he's not my Messiah type of mentality. Jesus was too different than what they had determined the Messiah was supposed to be like. Jesus didn't teach as they taught. He didn't talk like they did. He didn't have the same ambitions and the same mission as the Pharisees had. And so he was hated by them. So we get confrontation after confrontation in the New Testament throughout the Gospel uh, between Jesus and the Pharisees. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was one of them, you might say. But he wasn't just any Pharisee. He was also a member of what was called the Sanhedrin. Uh, in, in the most basic of terms, uh, this was the Supreme Council, the Supreme Jewish Council of the people in the time of Christ and even before that. So in other words, uh, like the scripture says, Nicodemus wasn't just any Jew, not just any Pharisee, but he was a leader among them the poster child of the Jewish faith, you might say. We hear all of this, all of those things about Nicodemus and, and who he is and, and how the group that he belonged to uh, constantly butted heads with Jesus. And, and we think and we hear all that, we say, really? Really, you mean Nicodemus, the, the, uh, a Jew of all Jews, the poster child of the Jewish faith, member of the Sanhedrin, he, he sought Jesus out in the middle of the night? And the response is, yes. That's exactly who sought Jesus out in the middle of the night. And that fact, that, that the fact that that happened, that's what leads me to believe and what should really lead all of us to believe that something must have been different. Something must have been different about Nicodemus. Something was going on in his life that seems to have separated him from those that surrounded him. You know, most of the, of the confrontations that we read about uh, between uh, the Pharisees and Jesus, uh, they happen in broad daylight. They happen uh, in and amongst the crowd with multiple Pharisees uh, around them. But for some reason, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. This was different, very different. Most would say that the reason that Nicodemus came at night was because he didn't want to be ridiculed by those uh, he was associated with. He didn't want them to find out about the conversation he was about to go have with Jesus. He didn't want them to find out that there was a little something more going on in his life. Another reason could have been simply that he wanted time alone with Jesus. And can you imagine how hard it would have been to have time alone with Jesus during the middle of the day? Constantly surrounded, constantly on the move. So... What was going on? What was going on in the, in the life of Nicodemus? It's as if, or it seems to me, and maybe we can see and, and think that, that maybe, maybe Nicodemus was looking for something. Maybe Nicodemus was searching for something. As I was uh, preparing uh, this sermon, I, I shared that same thought, the whole idea of Nicodemus looking for something. I shared that with a, with a pastor friend of mine, and, and he agreed, and he said this. He says, Nicodemus was looking for knowledge. Nicodemus was looking for knowledge. And I think that uh, my pastor friend is right, but 
I think that his search for knowledge points to a bigger search that is going on in the life of Nicodemus. William Barclay, one of my favorite uh, commentators, puts it this way. He says, Nicodemus was a puzzled man, a man with many honors, and yet with something lacking in his life. He came to Jesus for a talk so that somehow in the darkness of night that he might find light. There are a lot of people in this world, there are a lot of people in this country, there are a lot of people in this very community that are just like Nicodemus. They are looking for something. They are puzzled. They know that something is lacking in their lives. They might not be exactly sure what it is they are are searching for, what they're looking for. They might not have any idea how to satisfy that longing that they feel inside of them. And so they keep looking. And they keep searching. Oftentimes in all of the wrong places. You and I have been there before. They grow tired and, and hope begins to leave them because they just can't seem to find what it is they are looking for. And I don't know if if this, I don't know if this is what Nicodemus was looking for, but what he found in his conversation with Jesus was exactly what he needed. Exactly what everyone searching needs. The opportunity to be born again. The opportunity to become a follower of Jesus. The opportunity to become, to go from a caterpillar to a butterfly, the opportunity to be born again. In the church and uh, in our communities, I, I think we hear this term all the time, born again, born again. We, I've, I've heard it since I was tiny, and a lot of us have, born again. And what does it mean? What does it mean? We're not the only ones that may ask that question. Truthfully, those who have been born again may have a firm grip on exactly what that means. But for others, including Nicodemus, as we saw, the whole idea of being born again is a little hard to wrap your head around. It's a little confusing. Jesus tells Nicodemus very quickly in their their conversation that if he wants to see the kingdom of God, that he must be born again. If he wants to be a part of the kingdom of God, he must be born again. And this doesn't make sense to Nicodemus at all. Much the same way that it might not make sense to someone who hasn't grown up in the faith, in the church. It needs some explaining, I guess. And if we're honest with ourselves, the reality is is that if we as Christians are not having these conversations where we feel the need to explain and share with someone what being born again is all about, then we are missing something. Something is wrong. If we're not having these conversations, if we're not feeling the need to explain that, something is missing, something is wrong. And why? Why is that? Because if we're not having these conversations, then then there is a chance. There is a chance that we might not be taking seriously the commission that we have all been given. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The truth of the matter is that as followers of Jesus, we should be having these Nicodemus conversations. We should be having these conversations, not conversations that condemn, but conversations that tell of hope, conversations that tell of love, conversations that tell of mercy and the grace found only in Jesus Christ, conversations about being born again. When Jesus has his born-again conversation with Nicodemus, being very practical, being very practical, Nicodemus says, what do you mean? There's no way that I can be born again. I am not going back into my mom's belly. She was too good to me. I'm not doing that. I can't do that. I'm too old. It can't happen. What do you mean by that? In a nutshell, Nicodemus is saying, Jesus, tell me what you're talking about. 
I, I, I want this knowledge. I want to know what you're talking about. I want to understand what do you mean when you say I've got to be born again because it's not making sense to me right now. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean to be born again? Let me ask you, um, could you, could you help someone who might not understand, like Nicodemus didn't understand, could you help someone understand what Jesus is saying when he says you must be born again? Could you do that? If you can't, or if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'm not real sure about that, don't feel bad. Because there is not a person in this room who has not been there before. But, there's always a but, isn't there? But, as followers of Christ, if we're going to say we're followers of Christ, as followers of Christ uh, that should be having these Nicodemus conversations, it is so important that we are able, to the best of our ability, to the best of our human imperfect brain's ability, it is so important that we are able to explain what it means to be born again. Being born again means a lot. A lot. Probably a lot more than, than, than my brain and any of your brains can understand, but ultimately it means these three things. We're going to touch on these three things, and, and I want you to understand that this is very simplified. So don't, uh, you, you're welcome to, if you want to come up to, to me afterwards and say, Kevin, you missed this, this, this. I get it, I understand, but that's a whole other sermon for a whole other time. So focus on these three things with me, the nuts and the bolts of this. Being born again means these three things. First, we confess and repent of our sins. There's two things there, right? We confess and we, somebody finish it for me, repent, both of those things. Most simply, we acknowledge and admit that we are sinners, that I am imperfect, that I do not get it right, that I mess up, that we miss the mark, that we willfully disobey God. And we then repent. When we repent, it means that we turn away from whatever that sin is and turn back to God. Turn away and back to God. We confess and we repent of our sins. The second thing... Uh, being born again means that we place our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ. We acknowledge that what Jesus did on the cross is our only hope. Our only hope. We acknowledge that He is the Son of God and that He alone can save us. I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. No one else can save us. He alone can save us. We believe these things in our hearts and, and we put all of our faith, every bit of our faith, all we are into living for Him in response to the salvation that He offered us on the cross. We repent, we confess, we place our hope and faith in Jesus Christ. And the third thing, we welcome the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. The scripture says that the Holy Spirit moves, it's, it's, it's like, the, like the wind. Yesterday, um, I think it was yeah. Yesterday, I got to go. Um, Y'all know Harvey Beck, uh, who's a pastor over at First Methodist. He and I uh, got to take his little granddaughter Maddie. We took her turkey hunting for the first time, and uh, it was she did very good. It was very good. Uh, and and so we went. And, and after we got done, and, and we won't talk about how it went. But after we got done, we uh, the the property that we own, or I'm sorry, the property that we were on has this huge mountain back behind it. And Harvey pointed up to the top of it and he said, you see that bald spot they've cleared off? There, there's a road that goes up there. And uh, he said, after we got done, he asked Maddie, he said, Maddie, do you want to drive up there? And he said, yeah. I, uh, or she said, yeah, I'd like to do that. So we drove up there. And the wind, the wind that this Holy Spirit is compared to, the wind was so strong. Harvey was having to, to hold on to Maddie because her face was going to blow away. It was so strong. And as Harvey stands there, he says, you know, Maddie, uh, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. So the third thing we do is we welcome that wind. We welcome that Holy Spirit work in our lives. We submit to that work. And when we welcome that work, we grow and we become more and more like Jesus. We become more and more the creation that God intended and calls us to be. So there's three things. We confess of our sin and, and we repent of our sin. We place our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ. 
we allow the Holy Spirit, we submit, we welcome the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. Being born again means all of those things, and I'm here to tell you it means a whole lot more than that. But we haven't got quite enough time this morning. This passage, uh, this passage is one of those that when I knew that I would be uh, preaching on it, I, I just could not get it out of my head. I couldn't get it out of my head. The thought that kept coming up, uh, kept coming to my mind as, um, as I read this and as I thought over it and, and prayed about what it means to be born again, the, the thought that kept coming up into my head is the thought that we saw earlier in the children's moment, this thought of new life. See, born again means all those things we just talked about, but ultimately born again means new life. New life, brand new. See, I believe that, that this is what Jesus is getting at. I think this is what he's getting at uh, when, when, he, when he says to, to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. I think that's the message. He's, he's talking about starting over. Nicodemus, you don't have to be who you were. There's hope here. There, there's possibility. There's opportunity for change. Beginning a new life, leaving the old behind, leaving the old behind and starting fresh, brand new in Christ Jesus. As I thought about this, there were, there were these two um, examples uh, that, that came to mind. Um, and the first example that, that, that comes to mind when, when I think of new life, and, and you may think this and you may not, I don't know, but the first uh, being literally the new life that we see when a baby enters this world. About a month ago, I called Anise Scott and I said, hey, can you make this happen? Can you have your baby on Friday? That way I can talk about it on Sunday because I'm preaching. And she said, sure, why not? Uh, but seriously, the, the, the new life that happens, the new life that we see when a baby is born, I personally have no experience with the whole baby being born thing. We got a while before that happens, I hope. Um, but what I have had the opportunity to do is be around a lot of people who have just had brand new babies and to be around those babies. When these children enter the world, they have this complete and total dependence on their parents. Complete and total dependence. They simply rest in the fact that mom and dad have the knowledge and the ability to take care and supply their every need. When, a newborn ba- when, you, when you see a newborn baby, there's, there, there's, there's a certain innocence about them, Right? And those of you who have had newborns, you're saying, there's, not, there's no innocence when they wake me up at 2 in the morning crying. I get that. But even so, there's this innocence that seems to be so untainted by the world. And one of the most amazing things about a newborn baby is the beautiful hope and the future that comes with that newborn. We look at these children and we mark their existence in days. In days. Then it moves to months. And then it should move to years, but yet we still say 24 months. I don't get it, but maybe one day. We mark their existence by days and and, and months and praying and hoping for years and years to come for, for them and all that comes with that. But in that newborn baby, how exciting to think how exciting to think, how hopeful to think. And I'm going to quote a great doctor here, Dr. Seuss. Oh, the places they'll go. Oh, the places they'll go. What comes to mind when you think of a newborn? For some of you, that's much closer than it is to others. The amazing thing about being born again is that we get to experience new life in Christ as a newborn baby in the faith. We depend on our Father for all our needs. Our sins are washed away, covered by the blood of Jesus, and we get to taste a little bit of that sweet innocence. And we have our whole lives in front of us, and oh, the places we will go. As I thought about new life, I also began to think about a TV show that I started watching several weeks ago. Um, the, the show, you might have seen it before, it's called Intervention. Uh, and, it, and, and it tells the story of people who are crippled by some form of addiction. Um, it is absolutely heartbreaking. And so you say, Kevin, why are you telling me about this? Why are you watching that, right? I watch the show because of what happens at the end. So if you want to catch it, watch like the last 15 minutes. 
I love the show because of what happens at the end. The family and the counselor uh, come together for what they call the intervention. And, and they all sit down in this room, and, and the, the, the person who, who is struggling comes in, and they tell them how much they love them. They tell, they tell them how much uh, they, they have been hurt and how much they care for them. All those things. And, and once the family members have, have shared, the counselor that, that's kind of holding all this together then says to them, um, we have a room for you at a treatment facility in such and such place. Will you go? And the reason this reminds me of the story of Nicodemus is because just like Nicodemus, these people who feel hopeless, these people who are clearly looking for something, who are looking for more, are given the opportunity at new life. Some of them take that opportunity. Some of them take it, and some of them don't, and that is equally as heartbreaking. But my favorite part of the show, and this is, this is like when the credits are coming up, my favorite part of the show is, is when these words flash up on the screen, and it says something like, two months later, two months later, and, and when you see that pop up, then you know that they accepted that treatment, and that they stayed at the facility, and all those kinds of things, and, and then on the screen appears this, this new person, a new life. I think it's that transformation. I think it is, is, is this transformation, exactly that, this, this restart at new life, this being born, uh, reborn like, like a newborn baby. I think that is exactly what Nicodemus was, look, re- was really looking for, whether he realized it or not. I believe that deep down Nicodemus craved to be born again. He craved new life, and I think that deep down this is why he came to Jesus in the middle of the night, because there had to be more. I'm not sure that he thought it was possible. You know, how can I be born again? And we might not think it's possible either. Maybe he thought there was no hope for him. He had uh, had been who he was for for too long, maybe. He had a hard time wrapping his head around what it meant to be born again. But in spite of Nicodemus not understanding and being unsure, Jesus sat down with Nicodemus and had a conversation with him. And in that conversation, Nicodemus was offered new life in Christ. Just like it was offered to Nicodemus so long ago, Jesus still offers new life to each and every one of us today. Maybe you are are, are like Nicodemus. Maybe you have never given your life to Christ and experienced that that new life that is found only in Him. Uh, and, and, And there's no greater decision, there's no greater choice you can make or maybe you're like a lot of other folks. You, you have given your life to Christ, and, uh, but goodness, you've forgotten what it means. You've forgotten what it's like to be born again. You've forgotten what that new life feels like. You can ask God to remind you and renew that commitment to, to living for, for Him. God, remind me of what new life means. Remind me of what it means to be born again. Or maybe there's an area in your life where you need some of that Holy Spirit new life breathed into. Maybe it's your marriage, relationship with your family, your, your, your prayer life, I don't know. Whatever it may be, ask God to breathe that new life into that area of your, of, of your life and just see what happens. We can all be born again and experience new life in Christ. When it was dark, nobody else was around, Nicodemus went to see Jesus and was introduced to and offered new life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And this morning we've been offered the same. As we wrap up, as as we leave this place, may we remember that there are a lot more people out there looking, just like Nicodemus. They're searching for something. May we remember that. May we be looking for them as well. May we look for the Nicodemus in our lives. May we pray for them. May we have a born-again conversation with them. And may we too remember what it means to be born again to have new life by the love 
and the grace and the mercy and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen.